Now I'm going to give a lecture here about John F. Kennedy. And studying John F. Kennedy has become one of my many passions about studying history. Namely for several reasons. They, when John Kennedy was assassinated, like many people my age or a little bit younger or a little bit older, it's one of those events in history like 9-11, I guess if I'm not old enough, but Pearl Harbor, and you remember exactly where you were when that happened. You remember the, the I remember the confusion in the faces of people. I was a senior in high school, and I was standing on the stage in chorus practice. We had a small high school, and one of the ways to avoid going home and working on the farm every day or was to play a lot of sports, which I played every sport there was, football, basketball, baseball. I played in the band. I sang in the chorus. I joined the Future Homemakers of America, which was all girls, just so I could learn how to sew and things like that, but actually because it was all girls. That's what you do when you're 16 years old. But the story of John Kennedy right now is, is uh, beginning to cover the news. I'm taking a course. started a week ago from Harvard MIT. Uh, actually, the, the course itself is presented by a professor from the University of Virginia. It's an online course, four weeks, about John Kennedy. And because on the 22nd of November this year is the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. So I'll try to do this as open-mindedly as possible because uh, I've got my own. I'll explain to you as we go down the road. John Kennedy's from Massachusetts. We learn a lot about that when we live in Massachusetts. You can go to Brookline, Massachusetts, and you can go to the old Kennedy home. Uh, John Kennedy was born May 29th, 1917, two years before my father, in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was the second child of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., his grandfather, Joe and Fitzgerald, was a political figure and the mayor of the city of uh, Boston and known as one of the most corrupt mayors of the city of Boston. But he was of Irish descent. And by that time, and 100 years ago, you know, the Irish were the powerful political group in the city of Boston um, in, polit in, in politics in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact. He went to a private school because his father was the important man and he was well known, very nice young man, very good looking young man. He lived in his brother, he had an older brother, his name was Joseph Kennedy. And Joseph and John, John was, uh, they were into sports. Americans liked their American football, they considered that to be real football. But John Kennedy was a, a, a sick young man. He was very slender, um, but as you can see here, in 1935, when he got out of high school, he was voted the most likely to succeed. Uh, I was voted the most likely to succeed also, and I've been living in Guayaquil, Ecuador for 25 years, so you can make your own conclusions of whether high school predictions are really worth anything. After graduating from high school, we went to Princeton University, but he had to drop out, and he eventually went to Harvard University, and as you can see, majored in government and international studies, which served him well in his later life. As a lot of rich kids did in the 1930s, they didn't worry about the, de the, the depression, and uh, they went to Europe when they wanted, and he studied the beginnings or the build-up of World War II when he wrote a book in his senior year. I read it. It's actually pretty good. He did write it. He went to Stanford University for graduate studies and in April 1941 he wanted to join the Army but he got rejected but he, he went to the U.S. Navy. Uh, after December 7, 1941 he wanted to go to sea so they gave him an assignment at sea two years later, and he had his own PT boat, PT-109. It's a small torpedo boat, patrol torpedo boat is what the PT stands for. 
and long torpedo tubes on each side very very fast in those days the port tor tor torpedo boats would go like 35 40 maybe 30 and 40 knots and his was crushed one night by a Japanese destroyer they uh, some Navy guys I used to be in the Navy would criticize him as bad seamanship but at night when you're running through the Pacific Ocean and it's full of Japanese ships you don't want to have any lights on so the they didn't see the Japanese and the Japanese didn't see them their little ship was crushed completely and his men went overboard and he actually saved their lives by by getting his guys to a little island and then to another little island uh, he did injure his back uh, more and during now after the war John Kennedy his brother died in 1944 his brother was a, a, an airman in the US Army Air Corps and a special mission from England and his plane exploded the, and there was never any trace found of his brother and the brother was the as we say in English the apple of his father's eye and, and, and the father was intent on getting the oldest son uh, to become president of the United States but now it was the second son who had to carry this burden of a very overbearing father but an, 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 I was going to say equally overbearing mother, but she wasn't equal. She was the one who was overbearing, dictatorial. Uh, I have a book beside me that's titled uh, Kennedy Women. But Rose Kennedy wa was the, the toughest. And nobody ever stood up to Rose Kennedy. He ran for, for the state of Massachusetts to become a, a representative in the House of, in Congress and was, was a good talk, a good public speaker. He has a brother, had a brother, Robert Bobby Kennedy and Ed Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in 1968. Ed Kennedy was a senator from Massachusetts until about, he died about, I don't know, two or three years ago many 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 years uh, Ed Kennedy was a good senator he was my senator so when I needed things from the US government I would write letters to Ed Kennedy's office and they were very quickly answered where eventually he was elected to the Senate and in 1960 Ra John Kennedy ran for president of the United States on the Democratic ticket against Richard Nixon it's a very interesting story uh, the election of 1960 he won the election Richard Nixon lost some people say a lot of it had to do with um, the first televised nationwide debates between candidates so other people say it had to do a lot with corruption that his father who had it was a multimillionaire uh, bought votes in West Virginia Yes, that such things do happen. There is corruption in politics. And probably bought votes in uh, Chicago, too. Notorious, the city notorious for political corruption, particularly in favor of Democrats. Um, I mentioned this already. Nixon, on, on, in ca on camera, there are books written about this uh, public debate because it was the first one, and every one since then have taken their lessons. John Kennedy was a, a good-looking young man, very expensive Brooks Brothers suit that fit beautifully, very expensive in those days with a $200 suit. Now you can't even buy a tie for $200. And Nixon, who was not a, a, a good camera presence, to put it that way, he was, uh, he was sweaty, he was the kind of guy, some men have, have to uh, shave twice a day if they're going to be on in public in the evening, they shave. And so uh, Nixon looked uncomfortable. He had a cheap suit that wasn't tight around the collar, and he was sweaty, so he didn't have such an, a, a good appearance, camera appearance. Nixon had his, or Kennedy had his makeup on. 
the closest election of the 20th century. Of course, uh, they didn't count the one in, well, the 20th century. The one in, when was it? Uh, George Bush's first election where it had to go to the Supreme Court <laughs> to decide who. He won by 303 votes over Nixon's two. These are electoral votes. Uh, we don't have time to explain the U.S. electoral system. Youngest man ever to be elected to President of the United States at the age of 43. January 20th, 1961. He made a very famous speech, asked not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And if you push the button here on that picture, you can see the YouTube of the speech. It's a very powerful speech, and I was 15 years old at that time. And like everybody else, was, was greatly impressed. A big issue of John Kennedy running for president was that he was a Roman Catholic. And Americans were, not universally, but skeptical. Vice President Johnson, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice, President Eisenhower. I'm going to let you listen to that. His cabinet was balanced with um, very intelligent people. It, it mentions in your book, there's a very, very famous book that I've enjoyed reading a couple times. It's called The Best and the Brightest. And he surrounded himself with Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, McGeorge Bundy, Harvard Dean at 34 years old with a bachelor's degree. Doesn't happen today. Secretary of State Dean Rusk was a Rhodes Scholar. And Kennedy took over a, a, a difficult situation. Oh, he made his brother Attorney General, which we call nepotism, which you don't find very often, but his brother was the one he trusted the most. In that picture right there on the left is Edward Kennedy, and of course it is wedding Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, John Kennedy, and Robert Kennedy. His first crisis was four months after he became president. Fidel Castro in 1959, Fidel Castro took over and, and has, uh, declared himself the ruler of Cuba. He became a, using a communist-style government when he asked for a lot of things from the United States. One of them was permission to take over all the American companies in Cuba. That was denied. And when it was denied, Fidel just picked up the phone and called the Soviet Union. A lot of countries played off the Americans against the Soviets and Egyptians and throughout South America and S Central America and Africa for sure and Asia. If you don't get what you want from one of them, go ask the other one and you'll be sure to get it. Uh, which at this time was a communist country, were slaughtered. Um, Cuba, along with the Soviet Union, then secretly developed a plan and constructing missiles bases in Cuba. The United States in October of 1962. The United States uh, had these, I, I want to go back a little bit now that I think about it. The first real crisis was the Bay of Pigs and that was kind of a leftover from the Eisenhower administration Another scheme by the CIA to overthrow the Fidel Castro government. Eisenhower okayed the, the setting up of it, but he hadn't okayed the invasion yet. So the CIA, and you can see a lot of good videos on YouTube and watch about the Bay of Pigs. It was a disaster from the beginning. Kennedy did not want to... Um, use U.S. military forces. There were many Cuban exiles living in Miami. Some of them are still there. You can go to a restaurant. It's called, I think it's called Versailles on, uh, what's the name of the main street in Miami there? Calle Ocho. I've been in the restaurant. A lot of old Cubans sitting around drinking some, oh, some of the strongest coffee I've ever had and telling how they were heroes of the Bay of Pigs or something, but there were no heroes in the Bay of Pigs. They were suckers to get recruited by the CIA and dropped off in the Bay, and no secret to it, Fidel knew they were coming, and he wiped them out in a matter of hours. It was a fiasco. 
Well, Kennedy was very embarrassed because being the pre he he did not sub would not send in American troops, and he didn't want to use the United States Navy or the aircraft carriers with planes. Nothing involved in the United States military. Kennedy uh, and the CIA again set up a plan, Operation Mongoose. And I think it mentions it in your book. Ways of assassinating Fidel Castro, getting rid of the communists in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, all kinds of very strange plans. One of them was that Fidel Castro in those days used to be love scuba diving. So they were going to make rocks or what looks like rocks and send in the divers, American divers, to plant these rocks in the place where Fidel would be diving and someday when he would be diving the rock would blow up. I always thought that was a fun. Poisonous cigars, that was another good one. Uh, there's some good scenes. And uh, let me think. The Godfather number three about the United States and Cuba and the Cuban Revolution and throwing the mafia and everybody out of Cuba. Uh, it, oh yeah, it says in your textbook, I got in front of me, it says an attempt to harpoon him. The harpoon's that spear that you use for whales. I, I'm not sure about the harpoon, mean, but I do remember the explosive rocks. As a, as a result of this, Fidel Castro, along with uh, Khrushchev, they decided that to defend the future of Cuba against the Americans, they would put missiles, nuclear-tipped missiles, in Cuba. Well, in October of 1962, the United States had U-2 planes, which I showed you a picture of one in the last video. And one of the U-2 planes was flying over Cuba and taking pictures of everything. They took the pictures back and they exposed the pictures. In those days, we had to take pictures and then you had to take them to the... Uh, film shop and expose them, print them, and they saw the missiles. They knew what a, a Soviet missile site looked like. Well, that was unacceptable. You, no president of the United States. Kennedy said, if, if I'd allowed the missiles to stay there, uh, I would have been thrown out, impeached. October 22nd, 1962, and for 13 days, and there's a wonderful video uh, movie uh, on YouTube about the 13 days of October. I was in high school. I was a sophomore in high school. I remember it very well. We were all scared to death. We had all been raised in the 1950s. We had been told that the, there was this danger of a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And now that the Soviet Union had nuclear missiles that could reach Washington in three and a half minutes or ten minutes, I don't remember what it was, uh, we had built bomb shelters. We, we were told as little kids, if you see a bright flash outside, get under your desk, which we, as we got older, we thought that was pretty funny. But being raised in an atmosphere, and, and the movies of that period, being raised in an atmosphere of the possibility of nuclear holocaust, will give you a pause to think about it throughout life. I don't think young people think about this kind of thing anymore, but I can assure you there is a threat of nuclear war. Some countries that we don't even know about have nuclear weapons. If a terrorist ever gets a nuclear weapon, uh, I think there's a good movie. It's a Tom Clancy book. It's called The Sum of All Fears with Ben Affleck as a CIA agent. And they get a, they they the bad guys get a nuclear weapon, and they put it under the in a Coca Cola machine under the stadium where the Super Bowls, which is our big football game, in end of January, early February every year, and the nuclear bomb goes off. Well, it was a face to face, eyeball to eyeball, we say, confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States. Cruz, it actually. It was Khrushchev's miscalculation. They didn't believe that the United States would react the way they did. Eventually, there were some people suggesting invading Cuba. Others, uh, I had friends in the Air Force who were bomber pilots at that time, older guys. And a couple of them were, were B-52 pilots that sat on the runway 
at McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida with nuclear weapons in the airplane with the engines on what's called APU, auxiliary power units. You'll see them when you go to the airport, those great big things on wheels that they plug the plane into so that before they start the engines. They sat there 24 hours a day with the APUs. They were sleeping in, in trucks beside the, beside the things 24 hours a day, ready to take off in five minutes. Be over Cuba in like 20 minutes and nuke the whole place. Of course, other ones were going on north over the North Pole. Uh, there's a really good movie you could enjoy. It's called Failsafe. <laughs> yeah, you would enjoy it. Now that I'm thinking about it, it was about some guy um, who, some commander of a base that has the codes, and he goes crazy thinking uh, that the Soviets are going to attack, so he releases the planes uh, to attack the Soviet Union. Fail safe. On the Beach is another one. That's a downloaded. I've got that one too. Um, can't think of any others right now. Kennedy had to have faced, he had to pledge, promise, the United States would not uh, invade Cuba. He did. He didn't, he didn't say that they would have put an uh, embargo on Cuba, which they did. Uh, aside from the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, it says in your textbook about civil rights. Kennedy was a good politician. I don't really think that he cared much about the civil rights. I don't think he did much about the civil rights. He proposed what would be a Civil Rights Act of 1964, but he didn't really do anything about it unless it was a politically good idea. But through the early 1960s, the blacks in the South, and I remember as a kid, separate facilities in the theaters, blacks, black restrooms and white restrooms, water fountains, entrances in restaurants, black section, white section, blacks come in the back door. I remember riding the bus as a kid. Blacks had to sit in the back. 100 years after the Civil War, after, after the Civil War, after the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, but in the South, it was still strong segregation. Kennedy would become Kennedy had, uh, there's always a que several questions about Kennedy. One of them was, um, would he have gone deeper into the Vietnam War? It's difficult to say because it's, 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 it's speculative. I, I wouldn't. He did say that he thought that the Vietnam War should be fought by Vietnam boys to protect their own country, that they would draw withdraw American. There were no combat troops in Vietnam when Kennedy was assassinated. There were... Uh, a lot of advisors, thousands of them, but they had not sent the combat troops in, and they wouldn't do that until 1965, where after 1964, right after I graduated from high school, was the Gulf of Tonkin incident. I'm going to do a video here uh, about the Vietnam War, and hopefully in a few minutes, I'm having trouble downloading these things onto YouTube, but uh, that's the question. Well, Kennedy's coming up for re-election. In the fall of 1963, the re-elections in 1964, he goes to Dallas, Texas. You can find all kinds of videos and documents and everything you want to, much more than you want to know about the John F. Kennedy assassination. Riding in an open convertible, the governor of Texas sitting in front of him, his wife sitting to his left. Uh, I've taught this, uh, the assassination of John Kennedy courses, even to the Policia Nacional in Quito. Um, the conclusion of the government was that one person from a sixth floor window it was a uh, school book depository building full of boxes of books. I've been up there. There's a museum up there. A man named Lee Harvey Oswald fired from that window, as an expert marksman in the military and sniper training, I don't know how he made that shot, but that's what the conclusion was. And I don't know if we'll ever find out what the truth is. There's so many. There's a movie made by, I think it was Oliver Stone, JFK, 
but a lot of it is uh, presumptions and assumptions and it's it's don't take that for fact it's Hollywood once the first shot supposedly hits him in the upper right behind his right shoulder blade right to the left of his shoulder blade comes out around his neck and in a movie the Zeb, Zeb Gruder film you can see that on YouTube also you can see him reach with both hands up to his neck and as he bends forward another shot hits the right side of his skull right above his right ear and blows off a large and you can see it coming apart in the video the, the it's an old eight millimeter film is what it is his head jerks to the rear he falls to the left Jackie catches him and she's crawling to the rear of the car uh, some say it was to pick up pieces of his skull that had blasted to the rear. The conspiracy theorists, uh, the government said that this guy, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, fired the shots that killed Kennedy, including the one that blew off part of his head. Uh, a lot of people who have any knowledge of weapons at all if you hit something from the rear, it doesn't usually, something like that, somebody's head, the parts would not usually fall back against the direction of the bullet, but would be blasted forward. So this conspiracy theory is that there was another gunman on a little knoll of grass with a wall behind it, it's called the grassy knoll, firing from the front, and that's the shot that killed the president. You'll never know because uh, that, well, the experience was this. It was the, the, the shot was about 12.30 Texas time, which was 1.30 our upstate New York time. The secretary for, came from the office. That we were on stage in, in choir, chorus practice, not choir. And she whispered something in the ear of Mr. Benz, the chorus leader, choral leader. And I can still see him when he turned around. If you've ever heard the expression, the blood drained from his face, well, it does happen. And the tears were coming down his face, and he said to us, very choked up, please go back to your homerooms. Uh, the president's been assassinated. Well, there were kids standing around me that their families were Republican, so they started cheering out of their ignorance. Some of the rest of us, we were seniors in high school and we were allowed to have cars because it, it was a rural, it was a farm country up in the hills of New York. I remember getting in my car and driving out. To, I was going to pick up my senior pictures, the ones that go in the senior yearbook and all that kind of stuff, in this little town. And I remember parking the car. It was silence. There was no noise in that little village. People were standing around the store that sold televisions and the televisions were in the window and they were watching. People were just sitting crying. That The nation was in shock. The truth is the world was in shock. The next day, well, the body was taken back to Washington. Johnson sworn in as President of the United States. And the next day, Saturday, there was lying in state in the White House the next morning, on Sunday morning, lying in state, the, the caskets there and the soldiers on the corners of the casket and people viewing, and then it was taken to the Capitol building, and tens and tens and tens of hundreds of thousands of people filing past the casket, the nation in black. On Sunday morning, my mother and my sister, my brother and I, we went to Mass. My father, uh, I, don't know, I, know, I still don't know. I don't think my father was a religious person at all, unless his U.S. Army was his religion. We went to Mass, and when we came back, my father's running down the front. Our driveway was very, very long. And you're screaming, Oswald's been shot. And you can see that on your YouTube also. What a wonderful thing, YouTubes and Googles. Uh, a guy named Jack Ruby was a nightclub owner, strip club. He was a friend with the police, as most nightclubs, strip club owners would be. He went in and sh shot him and killed him, quieted him, shut him off. 
Ruby said later, Ruby went to jail for life. Ruby died of cancer about 1968 or 9 or something like that. Uh, he said, the world will never know the motive for the murder of John F. Kennedy and why I killed Oswald. And to this day, there's a lot of speculation, but I don't think the world really knows. Uh, it, it could be a lot of different things. The, the list, if you... I teach this in a face-to-face -face class. The CIA hated him. The mafia hated him. The military didn't want him to pull out of Vietnam. The military, they like they like wars because they can get lots of medals and stuff like that. I got a whole box of them over here. Um, maybe his wife didn't like him too much either because John F. Kennedy was very, very infamous, what we call a womanizer. He had a gorgeous wife. It, the period of John Kennedy's 1,000 days, was called Camelot, and it's a reference to the court of King Arthur, a legend, a legendary king of the hi in the history of England, and a beautiful wife, little kid, first president born in the 20th century. Uh, she was a very sophisticated woman. She took, she taught the French class when she went places with him. Uh, he actually said, I know you all came out to see my, my wife, not to see me. Um, he had a little boy, Caroline, who right now I saw in the baseball game in Boston the other day is now the U.S. ambassador to Japan. And a little boy, John F. Kennedy Jr., who tragically died in a, in a plane crash. He's, I don't think he knew what he was doing. He had a plane and crashed it just off of Martha's Vineyard, off of southern coast of uh, Massachusetts about maybe eight or nine years ago now I think uh, they had a presence the Americans were very thrilled uh, with the beauty of the president and his beautiful wife the family's perfect image was the reason why he was called the modern King Arthur Mrs. Kennedy redesigned uh, redid the White House and there was a TV program which you can also see on YouTube of Mrs. Kennedy showing the public on television around the redesigned and beautifully designed White House. Everybody wanted to have a Mrs. Jackie Kennedy uh, haircut and Jackie Kennedy fashions. Everything wasn't perfect. Yes, he was a womanizer and, and very quickly what this is about. Jack Kennedy was a very sick man. He had something called Addison's disease. And you can go look it up. A-D-D-D-I-S-O. A-D-D-I-S-O-N. And it's a... He needed a, a, a cortisone shots. And this, the, the theory is... He said one time that the, the cortisone... The, the shots made him extremely... Uh, how do I put this very politely? Overly sexed. So he needed to have sex every day. But his wife wasn't always there. So he had famous girlfriends like Marilyn Monroe. One of his girlfriends was named a lady named uh, Exeter was her last name. Well, her boyfriend was one of the big mafia bosses from Chicago. Judith Exeter was her name. Uh, you can see the picture right here. They were, the in that time, the perfect, beautiful couple. That's the way we thought about it. The course that I mentioned a little earlier uh, is also about the legacy of John Kennedy. When he died, oh, well, maybe there's another theory. I just happened to think of it that, that John, excuse me, Lyndon Johnson may have had something to do with his murder because Johnson wanted to be president and he hated the Kennedy. He hated Bobby Kennedy more than anybody, but he didn't like John, uh, John Kennedy because they kind of ignored him as vice president. Uh, af after Lyndon Johnson, all presidents have had this, um, they refer to Kennedy's speeches. Uh, president Obama does it. And Kennedy has not been forgotten. You will see a lot on U.S. television and a lot on uh, Go to the pbs.org website, um, public broadcasting system. You'll find a lot of things about John Kennedy in, in the next three, four weeks. That's Kennedy.